Hi, about a year ago, we designed and assembled a multi-element uh, single die LED light for an aquarium called a Cobb chip or a COB chip on board. The particular chip we used was a 3590 Cree chip that can produce up to about 20,000 lumens. And when we assembled this uh, in the video, we showed you how we used a very large heat sink. We fabricated some supports to be able to support it on the side of a tank and, and hold it above uh, the rim of the tank. It has a single LED chip inside with a reflector and it's hooked up to a dimmable Meanwell power supply. And if you're interested in this uh, design and what we did, you might want to take a look at that video. More recently, however, we've been working with these water cooling blocks for our refrigerator and freezer videos. And the interesting thing about these blocks is that they're very inexpensive. This costs about $3 on eBay. You can get them on Amazon as well. They come in a variety of sizes. And interestingly enough, they're relatively well matched to the size of one of these cobs. And so we thought it might be an interesting thing to do an update on the video by constructing another LED based light, but taking advantage of water cooling because of the fact that you can have a much lower profile by removing the heat rather than through a heat sink, removing it through a water system. This particular light, which is obviously far smaller than the old light, actually has two of these 20,000 lumen LED lights in it. In addition, because of the fact that it's using water cooling, it can keep the chips at a lower temperature, lower operating temperature, and therefore the chips will actually produce more lumens per watt. They're actually more efficient. There are some other advantages too to being able to remote the heat beside the fact that we can produce a much smaller, lower profile head. And so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show you how I went and put this head, which is the most significant construction part of this project, how I put it together. do is we need to make this sure that this is going to stay within the box. And this will get the two in series. Good. And then what we'll do, we're going to make sure the polarities on the two wires are appropriate because this is the positive and we can just check with an ohm meter to make sure that this positive corresponds to the appropriate lead as we put it into the power supply because you don't want to invert the polarities. It can damage the LEDs. And that's something we'll do before we put the final case on. Now the point is what we want to do is we want to put the sides that are going to cover this. And there's a little groove that has been cut here to allow this side to come over the wire and provide a wall or a side wall for the um, cover glass. And then the other one will mate like this. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a small amount or a small bead of five minute epoxy on here just to help stabilize this before we invert this and put it on top. So I'm going to take my inverted cup technique. We're going to grab a little bit of epoxy here and we're going to mix it up. Now these are both clear when you add them from one of these dual injection syringes. But when you mix them, what will happen is they will become opalescent for a minute or two because of the difference of the refractive index of the two, a part A and part B. And once they're fully combined, and fully mixed, then this sort of cloudiness will go away and then you know you have a good mixture. Now this shouldn't take very long to do, so I'm going to be generous in my mixing time here just to make sure I got all of the epoxy incorporated. Now the technique is to take a little Q-tip and we're going to apply just a small amount of epoxy here to the ends and only the ends. We're going to add some additional epoxy for strength later, but at this point, this is all we want to try to do is to get the two ends to stick together, to stick down to the uh, cooling block. So on a very thin amount of epoxy here, we don't want to put a big globby bead that's going to extrude all over the place when we put the block down on here. Looks pretty good. 
And one last step just between them. Put a small amount here to join the two parts together. Now for the very best bond with aluminum, little technique is to use an abrasive pad and actually sand the epoxy into the surface. What that does is the epoxy protects the raw aluminum that you make bare with the abrasive from oxygen. And oxygen forms an aluminum oxide which doesn't stick very well to the epoxy. So it's a nice technique to do that. I don't really have a lot of time to do that and I also don't need a great deal of strength here and I don't want to get any of that filing or sanding compound onto the cobs. That's better. Gets a little bit dicey when using these fast epoxies. Uh, they can go off pretty quickly. But one of the advantages of the epoxy being this quick is I can afford to just stay with it. So now we've waited a few minutes. I'm going to take off this counterweight. Clean up a little bit on the side here just in case there are any little bulges. Get it nice and dry. And let's just take a look and see if anything went all funny. No, not really. We may end up tacking that down a little bit with a little epoxy just to keep that from being overlying that one uh, component there. We can do that a little bit later. But this looks pretty good. Now what we're going to do before we glue this up is we're just going to examine the polarity here just to make sure that when we eventually wire this up and we can't access this, we're going to know which wire is which. So I have my little ohm meter here, and then we'll figure out which one that is. So I guessed right, that's the negative. So I'll take a little marker, and I'll make sure that that wire is identified as negative. Then, what we're going to do is we're going to turn this guy over. And we're going to reinforce this glue joint. So what we're going to do is take the epoxy that I had here before. But this time I'm going to use the, the mixing nozzle because it will make it a little bit more convenient to get this epoxy into a more selective syringe. Go ahead and put this all the way down here. And put a little glob of epoxy in the end of the syringe. It's just going to run a little bead along here. And this will help to seal it and also provide a little bit more strength to the bond between the side and the block. Not bad. Now I'll give this about 10 more minutes to firm up and then we're going to be putting the cover glass on with a little RTV using the same sort of technique that we used for the epoxy. Alright, so now this has had a chance to harden and become nice and secure. So now what we're going to do is you know, turn this over. We can clean off a little bit of this later on once the glue is not going to attract the dust from the cleaning process. And everything looks nice inside. What I'm going to do before we go too far is make sure there's no dust inside because once we seal this we're not going to be able to get in there anymore. Then. We're going to use some RTV here, and we're going to fill up a syringe just like I did with the epoxy. All right, so we'll put the plunger in here, put on one of the very fine nozzles. I'm going to put a very, very thin bead around the edge here. And we'll probably use the toothpick to thin it out even more because I don't want it to bulge into the... Uh, inside. Just want to make the whole surface on the top here wet. Get off any of the extra. Best way to clean our TV off if it does bulge out is to uh, use a razor blade. Once it's fully dried, it slices very nicely. Looks really nice. Okay, 
and then we got to put this on nice and square so we don't drag the glue into the field. Pretty good if I do say so myself. I like it. All right, so we'll let this all dry and cure overnight. <clears throat> and then finally, before I leave you, the idea to make this such a lightweight support is I turned the end of this in the mill. Uh, you could also do this with a file. As a matter of fact, I've fabricated two of these bent tubes. They can be made out of aluminum or stainless steel. They're hollow. They're going to act to direct the water. And by turning the diameter down sufficiently small, I can actually insert it in the end of the little hose barb that they have on the end of the uh, cooling block. And with a little rubber tubing, I can then attach this, and I will do that again tomorrow, so we get a good seal, and the metal will then maintain the rigidity so that it stays nice and straight and orthogonal to the, the right angle bend. But I've got two of these, and then they're going to be used to support the entire light over the fish tank and be held up at a variable distance above the fish tank, depending on what kind of uh, gallon capacity you have. So we'll get into a little bit more about the choice of the materials when we go back, and I'll show you how this thing is uh, operating above the actual fish tank. See you in a little bit. All right, so we waited overnight for the epoxy and the RTV to fully cure so that nothing would leak. And then what I went ahead and did is I attached the block to the end of those two tubes that I had reduced the diameter on and inserted into the ends of these hose barbs that come out of the blocks. And then I took a small segment of silicone tubing in order to provide a seal across that junction point. And then the wire that comes out of the back, I allowed this to lie along the underside of the uh, one tube and took small segments of heat shrink tubing just to retain it down here in order to bring it all the way down to the base to this block that supports the two tubes. Now, the block itself has two one quarter inch holes drilled fully through each side to allow the tubing to insert all the way through and to hang out the bottom. And then to retain it at whatever height I chose to, to keep it at, I use these small collar clamps to clamp the tubing and hold it at that point. And if you choose, you don't necessarily have to use a cantilevered block. You could just put this into a table. You could screw this onto the back of a table. You could just drill holes in, in the surface, whatever you like to do. But the principle is pretty obvious. To the ends of the two tubes, we've connected two silicone tubes to guide the water in and out. And then over here, you can see that there is a line coming out that provides power from the Meanwell LED dimmable driver that can provide up to 90 volts, which can drive the two 35 volt LEDs in series. And in addition, there is a second line here that runs over to the dimming function that this uh, particular unit is provided with. You can dim either with pulse width modulation, you can dim with a zero to 10 volt external power supply, or you can dim by varying the resistance through a variable resistor or a pot from zero to 100 K to allow you to adjust the light all the way from off to dim, all the way up, and I mean all the way up, one half the intensity of sunlight at the equator at noon on the top of this tank. More than 20% more light than a 400 watt metal halide would make from this tiny little head. And it's obviously overkill for this small tank, but you can see the potential of this kind of lighting system. Now, the system itself is obviously pretty straightforward. The interesting thing though about these uh, water cooling options is the fact that when you have a very small tank like this, you have a relatively large surface area to volume. And as a consequence, the heat will exit the tank more quickly generally than the heat that you're putting in, either through the pumping action or the lighting. And so you usually have to use a supplemental heater to keep the, the temperature in the tank at a desirable level, unless you've got a very, very hot room. However, as the tanks continue to increase in size, their capacity or their volume increases as the cube, but the surface area for heat loss increases as the square. And because the heat that you're adding to the tank in the form of lighting and pumping tends also to go up with volume, even the lighting does, because even though we only increase the surface area by the square, we also have to penetrate deeper. And so generally it goes up by the volume, not by the area. And so as the heat input increases by the cube and the heat loss increases by the square, eventually you get to a point 
at around 400 liters or about 100 gallons, where you no longer need to add supplemental heat, you need to begin thinking about trying to get heat out. And often what you end up having to do is purchase a chiller. It's an inline compressor-based phase change cooling unit to try to draw some of the heat out. Alternatively, you could put a big air conditioner in the room that the fish tank is mounted in to try to keep the air temperature down enough so that it can radiate out. But again, that's a lot of heat, a lot of electrical use. The advantage of using the water cooling is you could simply divert the heat to another location where you really don't care about it. It could be in a basement or a garage or outdoors or some other location, not within the room that the tank is in. So that can save a lot of power because that's a much more cost-effective way of removing heat than chilling the inside of the fish tank. Now to do that, you would obviously need a radiator and a pump and uh, fans in order to be able to get that heat out of the water that's warmed. However, in a smaller tank, there's kind of an elegant thing that occurs because we want to add heat to the tank and we have a reservoir, we have a pump, and we have a radiator. And so in this tank, what we're doing is we're actually using the aquarium water to cool the light. Now, because the water is not in contact with the electricity, it's just cooling the block, it doesn't necessarily conduct any electricity into the tank. But one thing you have to be careful about is the metals that you use uh, in the system can corrode or can be dissolved into the tank. Now, plastic obviously isn't, isn't a problem. Stainless steel wouldn't be a problem. But copper and aluminum will both dissolve into the water, and that's not good for marine life or a planted tank. Even though copper sometimes is used in low doses for therapeutic reasons, you don't want to just willy-nilly dissolve it out of your, your tubing and send it into the tank uncontrolled. It's easy to use stainless steel for the tubing here, and it's easy to use plastic for all of the feed lines and the pump. But the problem is our low-cost heat sinks are made out of aluminum, and you don't really want to try to get this fabricated out of stainless steel, kind of negate the whole money-saving idea. So my son came up with a brilliant idea, and let me show you what he did. I took one of these blocks and put it in the mill and cut the surface off so you can see the internal dimensions. And so you can see it has a lot of surface area for contact, and that's, that's excellent. But it also has a lot of surface area for interacting with the water. So the idea he came up with, which was to take a couple of syringes and a couple of small tubes and effectively, you fill one of the syringes with some low viscosity epoxy. And then by using the two syringes, what you can do is you can inject the epoxy into the block back and forth in this orientation so that any bubbles that are inside eventually are going to get washed out. And as you do this maybe a dozen times or so, what will happen is you'll fill the entire side, coat all the surfaces with epoxy. You then take the tubing off and just mount it upside down like this and let it drain. And when it cures, you have a thin layer of epoxy covering all of your exposed metal. It's a couple of microns. It's not going to provide any insulation resistance, but it has an added benefit that some of these really cheap blocks leak. Well, they won't leak anymore if you've coated the inside with epoxy, and they also won't degrade or corrode if you've coated them with epoxy. There's enough epoxy in a 10cc syringe. You could probably coat 15 of these blocks. So it isn't a very costly thing to do. It's very easy, very fast, and very reliable. It would, it would coat the inside very effectively. So kind of a neat thing. Save power, make uh, a lot of light. Uh, it's quiet. It's, uh, I think, pretty attractive. It's low, <laughs> it's low profile, so it doesn't get in the way. You can maneuver it around, and you can fabricate the tubing to fit any kind of style or any shape tank that you want, and you can get these units up to four LED long. So you could produce a tremendous amount of light with a relatively low profile head. So I hope you found this interesting. This is a lot of fun. I think we're going to exchange one of the lights upstairs with this unit. And I want to really thank you for uh, not only watching, but uh, subscribing and maybe linking to the channel because anything that you can do to help us grow is going to help us to bring you more videos like this. So I wish you a wonderful evening. You have a good night.